this time's tight. Um, it's more than my duty to introduce Susie. Um, Susie doesn't need much introduction. <laughs> I hope. Um, so Susie's got an interesting background, um, a longer association with Australia than, than you might think. Um, she did her master's <coughs> project um, at Ames on tiger prawns. Was that with Kate? Yeah, with Kate Wilson. Okay, with Kate Wilson just before she left, I suspect. Yeah, exactly. Um, and then she returned to Germany and did a PhD, and completed a PhD at um, Technical University of Munich um, and the Helmholtz Center in Munich, which is the environmental health um, Helmholtz Center, studying telomerase uh, in stem cell maintenance in zebrafish brain. Um, she's been back in Australia for two and a half years, something like that. Um, and she's been with us for uh, two years. Um, she's been working on um, what's quite a challenging topic, um, more challenging than it may seem superficially. Um, but also, she's essentially been, although she's a postdoc, she's uh, essentially my girl Friday. <laughs> She's done a remarkably good job in, in organising, making things happen in the lab. Um, so what would otherwise be total chaos is yes, now the, you know, the, the most efficient we've got in the lab. So, um, yes, that's, that's your introduction, I'm afraid, Susie. <laughs> So let's talk about sex, or more to say, the molecular basis of sex determination in sperm, germ, uh, germ cell differentiation in corals. So we all know corals are under threat due to several anthropogenic uh, causes, um, like the increase in CO2, the increase in water, and uh, the rise of water temperature, um, pollution, as well as um, uh, increase in coral bleaching events and also the nest severity. And this ha has led to some dramatic widespread decreases in the coral cover, but also in, um, in some, which some studies suggested that the, the overall fitness of the corals decline due to those stressors. And therefore also the reproductive output. These two studies that I would like to quickly introduce is um, showing that the temperature as well as the rise in CO2, uh, CO2 the uh, fertility of the sperm decreases quite, um, quite significantly. And as well, not only the sperm um, uh, fertility decreases, but also the settlement percentage of the then um, fertilized juveniles decreases over an increasing CO2 level. In another study, they followed a um, severely bleached, uh, severe bleaching event um, on, a, on the west coast of Australia, and they could show that several years after that bleaching event, that the reproduction, reproductive output was basically zero. So it took the, the corals a lot of time to then have enough energy again to be able to reproduce, because the reproduction is a very energy-consuming <coughs> energy event in the coral life. So it seems that those... Uh, seems that those environmental, uh, those changes in the environment seems to trigger adverse reproductive behavior in corals. But what actually is coral reproduction? So corals reproduce either sexually or asexually. When they reproduce sexually, they can reproduce either as hermaphrodites, so simultaneously releasing eggs and sperm bundles into the water column, which then um, fertilize and sooner or later form a plenary that and settles and forms the primary polyp. But they also can, um, uh, can sexually reproduce as gonochoric species, where they have separate sexes, which either release eggs or sperm, which then combine in the water column as well. And then there's a third um, way of how they can reproduce, which is the sequential hermaphrodites. So those um, corals are either male or female during one spawning event, but for some strange reason they are also changing their sex during their lifetime 
and then they are either the male or the female, so they often see sex what they can do for. When they reproduce asexually, they can either pr um, produce um, new offspring by budding off or after the recovery of some fragmentation events. However, we already know quite a few about the mechanistic background of this um, reproduction in corals as well as in other um, species. However, what we don't know is what the molecular or the genetic background is behind all this. And that's exactly what I would like to address in my study. <coughs> so basically what we don't know are the mole molecular mechanisms underlying those various reproductive strategies and also what are the genes that are involved in sex determination, sex differentiation, and the maturation of the germ cells. I do this, I have this thing here, sorry. <laughs> so, um, so what are the different mechanisms that can influence sex determination? We have either, oh gosh, wrong button. We have either sex-specific chromosomes, like in us humans or in most mammals, Temperature can have an influence on sex determination. Social cues, like in the fish, or the fertilization stage, like in the honeybee. And those mechanisms often extrude downstream, uh, conserve downstream targets. And one of these targets is a transcription, a family of transcriptional factors, the DM domains, G DM domain genes. The DM domain genes. Um, were independently discovered in Drosophila, where they were named double sex, and in C. elegans, where they were named male abnormal 3 or MAP3, and that's where the DM comes from, not from David Miller. Unfortunately. They have been found expressed in most phyla in the animal kingdom, and their expression is also sex biased and lead to the male um, germline. Um, germline and testis formation. However, some of those DM domain proteins are not actually involved in sex determination, but in other pr um, processes during development. So before I go in, in more detail into those DM domain genes, I quickly would like to introduce you to some terminology that I will use during my talk. So there are the stem cells. The stem cells are unique cells that can either replicate itself and then basically form new stem cells, or they differentiate into, so to say, um, tissue-specific stem cells. And those tissue-specific stem cells, for example, can be the germline cells, which then differentiate into the sperm or the egg cells, so our gonads. And another interesting fact that we should um, keep in mind is how sex determination actually works in, as in mammals. And here, the example of the mouse, the sex determination is very early in, in the development, basically before they are born, the sex is already determined. Whereas in the coral, and therefore thereby inferring from what we know from Hydra, is that the determination of, um, of the germline is in the late and mature specimen. So the specimen grows up to an adult, and at a certain age, um, <coughs> some cells differentiate into the germline cells, which then give rise to the ovary or the testes. So what we already found is not only that the DM domain proteins are conserved in most animal phyla, but it's also actually conserved down until the acropora millipora. And in this study, um, they found this one DM domain um, um, protein, and they could show that during development, and then especially shortly before a spawning event, the um, expression of this protein is very high or increases dramatically. From other studies also could show that there are some um, genes that have been implicated either as sex specific or germline determining that we find those homologs also within the aquapora millipora genome. So this leads you to my research aims it's based, that I would like to show here. So I would like to address the question of what are the molecular bases of the sexual determination and differentiation in the coral species. Can sex-specific genes be identified in corals and are those maintained then during evolution? Do the domain genes determine the sex in corals, which most likely could be? Um, and which are the specific molecular mechanisms underlying the various reproductive strategies that the corals developed? <coughs> 
And to address these aims, I would like to have, I would, I do that in a dual approach. And um, I will take the advantage of um, two different um, groups. The Fungide, which is a very neat system that was um, quite neatly characterized by Yossi Loya, and the um, coral model system, the Aquapora Melopora. The Fungita are sequential hermaphrodites, so during some time in their life they change their sex, and this has been documented by Yossi Loya that they not only change their sex once, but they can also reverse their sex back. Um, however, <coughs> The problem is I don't have little or no transcriptomic data. But the identification of sex-specific genes would be very interesting in this, in, this, um, in, those, in this coral group. On the other hand, I have the Acropora melopora, where I have um, sequenced genomes and transcriptome data available. We already could identify a DM domain protein, which seems to be a sex mining gene. Um, but the problem is they are simultaneous hermaphrodites. So the identification of sex-specific genes proves rather tricky within these. Um, I just want to make here another point that those two um, coral, species, uh, coral um, families belong to the two different Asclerotin superclades. So my approach, I would quick, like to quickly show you in this flow, um, workflow diagram. So the fungita I, I spawn during the spawning events to be able to identify male and female specimen. Then I take tissue samples for an aid um, extraction, which are then um, used for transcriptomic um, sequencing and analysis. And this hopefully then will allow me to identify sex-specific genes and maybe even follow those sex changes, what's going on in the sex change. On the other hand, I have the Aquaporida, where we have the sequence transcriptome um, already available, and with data mining, so sex genes that have been implicated in literature as sex um, genes, um, I can look for homologs and then perform some expression studies which allow me to see if those genes are expressed then in um, germline or gonadal tissue. And comparing these two um, um, families, then I might be able to find um, uh, I might be able to find the differences between their um, their sex specification, um, their way of how they specify their sex. So, I, as a next, I would like to show you my actual data. So I'm focusing on three different um, fungid groups, the fungia concina, connectus echinata, and the fungia fungitis, um, which have been quite nicely characterized by Yossi Loya, and he is working on the Japanese group, uh, a Japanese um, fungid reef. And he could show that connectus echinata <coughs> is a spawner and um, demonstrated also this bidirectional sex change. Here, um, for the fungia fungitis, um, they were they are a brooder in the Japanese colony. Um, they are gonochoric, but the interesting thing is that they are protogynous, which means that they are first female and then they change to a male, um, male sex later on in their life. For the fungia concina, um, they are also um, supposed to be spawners and gonochoric. At the GBR, um, I could basically confirm that all species are spawners and gonochoric. Um, sex change wasn't documented yet. So my study site is the um, Orpheus Island and Polaris, um, as well as a little reef here called the Lady Elliot Reef, which is also which I would also like to call the Fungitis Reef because the only um, fungi that can be found there is the Fungia Fungitis and no other fungi, um, other cor corals, but no other fungi. Um, here you can see the, the, the numbers of uh, collected specimen from, my, from the two spawning years, from 2011 and 2012. The numbers in the brackets um, show the numbers of um, corals that I could relocate, but these also include the deceased ones. So let's have a look at my data. i first like to show you the data for the Ctanactus echinata. In this diagram here, the... the the distribution of the sex versus the length and the weight of the corals is, is shown. The little um, crosses 
are the females, <laughs> the males are the circles, and the non-reproductive um, specimens are the triangles. And oh, sorry, I tried to do this here. <laughs> so what we can see that the um, Thanactus echinata is a protandrous um, species. So they first develop the male sex and the smaller animals, and then at the later stage they change the sex and become human. The other interesting um, notion is that the earliest sex, um, uh, the earliest fertile um, uh, specimen can be found which around 15 to 20 centimeters, which is also um, which is more which is larger than what Yossi Loya told me in a, person, uh, in a personal um, conversation, he actually expects in this area already the sex change going on. Whereas my sex change most likely um, is referring to quite some larger specimen in, 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 at the GPR. The reason for that is not, um, can't, I can't make any suggestion for that. However, what I could do is I followed um, those relocated corals, and for eight, I actually um, show here in this diagram their growth during the two years, um, and I also found two sex changes. So an infertile um, specimen became a male, whereas this one is a real sex changer. So a male, um, this male specimen, and then a year later became a female, um, reproduced as a female. Um, next, I'd like to show you the data for the Fungia species. In blue are the Fungia <coughs> conitis, and in orange are the Fungia concina. Again, in the females are the crosses, the male are the circles, and the non reproductive are the triangles. Um, here again, we can see that both species are protandrous, so first developing the male sex and then developing the female sex. Um, the female sex. What I also noted is that the fungia fungitis um, are very early fertile, whereas the fungia concina are fertile at a much later and therefore larger state. Oops. The other bit that I noticed is that um, the sex change in the fungia concina happens quite early in, in development, whereas for the fungia concina, uh, fungia fungitis is um, later, they actually have a very long male um, sex, sex life. Okay, so I made, uh, in 2011, when I collected my um, samples for the transcriptomic analysis, I collected it from the fungia concina because they had most of the data available of the sex. Um, so I, cho I, I could relocate um, four months after the spawning, after a very severe storm came through Orpheus, three females and two males, which I then um, expect, um, uh, extracted the RNA for, for some really deep RNA sequencing, which was done through microgen on a high sec 2000 um, platform, and they performed 100 base pair and breeds. The, this is the output from microgen, and you can see that um, I have um, a very um, high reading amount, as well as um, expected GC contents and a really good quality of the reads that we um, got back. So to get from the um, from the from the just reads to the annotated um, um, transcript home, um, Sylvain Ferre used a really nice um, working pipeline. And if you have some questions about it, you please address them directly to Sylvain. I'm definitely not an expert, so but I quickly like to summarize of what I understood. <laughs> so the initial bit is that you are trimming the reads for the quality, the length, and you remove the adapters. And then you have a de novo assembly using this Trinity software. And after that is done, you can then um, look at the GC content of those um, contexts that you generated. For the larvae, um, which I use as a control tissue, um, I get a um, uh, a normal distribution with the highest peak um, 
of, around, of a GC content around 40, which we expected. For the adult tissue, however, I get a two-peak curve. And this two-peak curve, if you then um, blast some of those contexts that are within the first peak, you get coral sequences. When you blast within the second peak, you get the souk sequences. And this is due to the fact that from the coral adult tissue, there are already souks in, within it, and you basically also extract those um, during, the, uh, during the iron extraction. So, however, what we can see as well is that those two peaks really overlap quite largely here in this, uh, in this domain. And to separate these two, um, Sylvain made use of a very neat technique, the support vector machine. Where you feed in all the sequences, then you generate a clean, uh, a, a training set of a clean um, coral, um, coral hits and of clean stux hits. And those training sets then are, are used to further predict the um, unknown hits or the unclean hits. Um, at the same time, those always feed them back into the training set. And um, he could perform this, um, this generation of the training set um, to an efficiency of 98.9%. So very high efficiency. And after that, the two... Um, um, graphs basically could be split in the souks part and in the coral part very nicely. So then follows that uh, assembly round two, where you basically map the initial raw data onto this SVM um, predicted data set, and you get a con coral specific um, context set of 235,000 contexts and a souk specific assembly of um, almost 70,000 contexts. Um, to summarize basically those contexts um, and to reduce the redundancies, um, the contexts were clustered, and after this clustering, we get um, 92,000 clusters within the coral assembly and 44,000 clusters within the SUX assembly. <coughs> and as a last step, of this pipeline is basically the annotation of the coral and the souks assembly. And here in this table, I summarize basically the, the number of the clusters, and within those clusters, they're not only proteins, but also non coding RNAs, different alleles from the genes and splice variants included. And for each cluster, for the um, Millipora cluster, there was a protein prediction of 32,000 proteins. And for the soups, it was 43,000 um, proteins. So this shows that um, you can actually assembly a, put in, um, a soups um, transcript home from, directly from coral tissue. You don't actually have to go and do the intermediate step of a, uh, of a soups culture which is quite neatly done and hasn't been demonstrated before. But the very interesting part is basically the analysis of the differential gene expression between my like male population and my like female samples. And with an initial look, we could identify 200 genes that are differentially expressed with a threshold of 5%. Um, but of course, I still need to look, have a closer look at what these genes actually are. So at this point, I like to change to my other part, the um, acropora part. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we already have um, sequence transcriptomes from acroporida available, <coughs> and making use of those, I basically mined them the literature for genes that have been implicated in germline specification, sex determination, as well as looking at hormone receptors, which are also then um, differentially expressed between the two sexes. So my first candidate of genes is, of course, those DM domain genes, <coughs> the double sex mod 3 domain genes. And within the Acropora genome, I find six um, clusters. These two clusters are, um, are alleles of each other. That's why it's six plus one. Um, so six clusters, um, <coughs> six clusters which have a, a really high hit to, D, to the DM domain genes. Um, Looking also at the number of DM domain genes in other species, we also uh, could find six um, DM domain genes in Acrophora digitifera, 
four in anastostella, there are five in mouse, and there are three um, uh, double sex genes um, known in Drosophila, and still only one double uh, MAP3 um, genes found in C. elegans. <clears throat> I then used those clusters and aligned them against other known um, DM domain genes and could generate this phylogenetic tree. And here, um, highlighted in this orange, you find the, the phylogenetic relationship between the clusters and the other um, genes. In this tree, I used um, DM domain genes from mouse, human, Drosophila, C. elegans, um, and other species. So before I like to show you my expression, I quickly like to remind you of where we find the gonads within the coral polyp. So this is a section through an adult polyp, and the gonads would be found um, <coughs> in the, in, in the gastro, gastrovascular cavity uh, with, uh, within mesoteral structures, which are here highlighted in purple. Um, however, what I will show you is a cross-section through an adult um, nubbin of a coral, and here in the cross section, which looks similar to what I will show you, I highlighted again the orientation of where we would expect some um, gonadal tissue or germ cell tissue. So let's have a look at the expression data. Here in this in situ hybridization um, that I performed against the different DM domain genes, you can see that early in development they seem very ubiquitous, um, ubiquitously stained. Um, but when you then look in this cross-section of the adult um, <coughs> specimen or as an adult um, tissue, you see quite nicely um, stringy mesenterial restricted expression um, within this. I also performed a developmental analysis of the different um, DM domain genes because the acropora transcriptin that we have available is not just from um, one specific stage, but it actually includes all the different developmental stages and adult tissue. And the DM domain genes can be clustered into four groups com um, um, in regards to their developmental profile. So the first group is where we have a high expression um, from plenally and then ongoing into the adult. Then the second group is um, where we have high expression at the gastrulation stage, but then it drops <coughs> quite dramatically until then um, the adult stage. Then there is this cluster where there is pretty much um, constant uh, expression throughout the whole development and into the adult. And the third, uh, the fourth group is we have um, again a high expression from plenally onwards with a slight drop um, in the adult. But further analysis will show um, what is um, what is really going on. This. Our next gene family that I addressed were the nanos and Vasa um, gene families which are implicated in germline formation and germline specification. And here I show you the expression study um, for, for nanos. We again see a very ubiquitous staining in the early settled polyp, but then in the adult um, um, cross-section we find again um, structures which most likely can be germ cell um, of germline specific mesenteries. Another group which has been um, newly indicated as, sex, uh, as genes in, um, in the sex development are the PV genes or pRNA interacting um, proteins, which are um, highly abundant in the germlines um, in the uh, during sperm, um, sperm maturation, but they are actually function is still unknown. And then we have the, the hint genes, um, which have been shown to be um, responsible for either the male when it's um, uh, the male or the ovary um, development. And here as well, it's not as easily to see, but in the early um, stages, the expression is quite ubiquitous. Then in the later stages, the, trans um, the expression is um, in, um, uh, within mesenteries of, of the adult tissue. And last but not least, I would like to show you the stemless genes, which are the Foxel, SOX, and OTX, um, which are, um, are shown to be um, 
expressed in, in stem cell in, in stem cell like cells, um, but they also were indicated in um, in, in the switch from the sperm to the uh, from sperm to uh, to egg um, in this exchange from from a male to a female um, fate in the C elegans and. So I also looked for the gene expression for FOXO, a very similar expression again, ubiquitous in the early stages, but then um, more strikingly and uh, um, restrictively expressed within mesenteric structures in the adult. Another group that I haven't addressed at all yet, um, but I had already a look for um, homologous, um, homologs within the Acropora genome are the hormone receptors. And here it's not on, would be only interesting to see the in situ expression, but also to study them um, immunohistochemically, so using antibodies, which might prove a bit tricky. Um, I was curious of how the sex genes between Acropora millipora, which are um, uh, which is a part, uh, which is a, co a coral of the complex superclade, are um, are comparable, to, uh, are homologous to to the fungia genes, which are which um, which are basically from the robust superclade, and therefore I used um, the farmers that I designed for Acropora millipora, but used it on cDNA for the three different um, fungia species, and as you can see here in this table or here in this gel picture, that I get. Um, by high percentage of um, positive PCR products, and this shows that the, the, there's a high degree of conservation between the sex determining genes of the robust and the complex corals, which is another very interesting point. So at this stage, I'd like to summarize my findings. Um, for fungi concina, we could assemble the transcriptome and already annotate it. Um, not only for the fungia, but also for its symbiodinium clade. I would, um, for its symbiodinium clade. The initial look of the gene expression showed that there are about 200 genes that are differentially expressed between the male and the female coral. If for the mine part, I could find homologous genes for sex determinant genes um, just by um, blasting against the transcriptome, and those sex genes. Um, are possibly um, specific to germline expression within the adult tissue, and here you can see a close-up. So, but there's still quite a bit of things that I would like to do in my few remaining months. Um, definitely the in-depth analysis of those 200 genes, and also look um, with, um, ex um, with expression studies um, in C2 or qPCR, how those genes are differently um, uh, expressed between the male and the female sex, to what degree. Um, this will then hopefully allow me to identify the sex of spe specimen prior to spawning, which would be really neat, <laughs> and possibly also allow me to follow the sex change over time and maybe also see what environmental conditions are necessary or implicated in this in this sex change. For the Acroporida, I, of course, like to extend the expression studies of those uh, sex-implicated genes, um, but I also like to have a look at um, the expression of those genes during the different stages of the gonadal development. Um, yeah, of the gonadal development. And then, <coughs> last but not least, it probably is very interesting to see and how those two different reproductive types compare with each other in relation to their gene expression, because it's not said that uh, Hermaphroditic acroporida actually uses the same genes, male and female, at the same time as what the two different sexes in Fungida do. So last but not least, I'd like to thank the lab, people from the ARC Center, and from Amy, and UQ for listening. <laughs> thank you very much. Questions? Yeah. Like, what, what's that? Because it's pretty much on it, almost every. I don't know. Um, those sections that are kind of really thick, they're about um, five mil thick. 
<coughs> group sections uh, or a section of declassified nubbins, but I want to look in more detail with um, prior sections of her conceptions of what I can actually see, if, what type of cells might be staying on the outside. I want to come back. I think so. That was really struck by the small number of females in those populations. Yeah. So I think Yossi's idea is that the reason for the sex change is to do with energetics in terms of there's such an investment in, yeah. in eggs. So you go male the next year. What was the conditions like in the years before that? Is that driving that small female population and that was stressful two years before that? Or is this immediately after Yossi? Yeah, Yossi? it is after Yossi. It is after Yassi, so it could be that despite it being on the protected that, that, that one, sorry, this one, I'm sure. That this, this, um, like they were on the protected side of the of the reef or of the islands, but it still had probably an effect of it. And as I said, like coming back four months later after that storm went through um, Orpheus as well as Townsville, where we had a little tornado going on in Townsville. Um, I could hardly recover any of those pearls, and so they were just randomly distributed. And I think when the cyclone went through, I'm pretty sure that also had quite a dramatic effect on them. But uh, your number is 14 to 19. I mean, given that sample size, that maybe not too. Oh yes, I was looking at the. Uh, yeah, the top here. Yeah, the top yeah, here. Yeah, that in in Xenactus is even worse. Uh, I'm sorry. Where is it? Yeah, there you go. Four females. So um, the tricky bit with those um, synaptics is um, during the day they are of course sucked in with their tissue and then to really identify the synaptics echinata compared to the synaptics grassa. It's harder with the bigger ones, but with the smaller ones it's really tricky. And actually um, one species that I identified as synaptics Echinata in 2011, then proved to be a Tinnitus Casa in 2012. So, yeah. I have a question, I was just going to show my ignorance. That's okay. Um, when you get to the end of this section, you talk about um, you know, the context from the next generation yeah. sequencing. Actually, let's get to that slide, the very last slide. This Maybe one? Just, no, know, one more. Here we go. This one, yeah. So you said next set analysis, analysis of different, and then you said 200 different genes are differently expressed between male and. Did you? De how did you determine that? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> what I'm asking is, that's been determined directly from the from from the not from from any from subsequent. Um, no, it's basically how how, um, how many how many there are in each of these different. Yeah, basically how how often those contexts are. Um, it, are in the males and in the males so and the females. Based on frequency. Yeah, on frequency. Right. Yeah, sorry. Yes, it's based on frequency. Yeah. Yeah. Frequency. Based on a, at the moment, it's based on a relatively small number of replicates. So yeah, and that as well. Well, replicate individual. Um, biological yeah. replicates. Yeah, five. Yeah, five. Yeah. So I would like to and extend that as well. Yeah. Um, in fact, with more individuals, you can probably um, more reliably find differences. So I think maybe yeah. more significant. More signal, more genes will be significantly differentially <coughs> expressed yeah. if we can get more look out animal, more animal. Yeah. 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 Well, The one Ichinata that was a male in 2011 and the female last year, they have this huge, in well, not huge, in the, in the um, scale in, in weight. I think it's only, I mean, it's probably an increase in density of the skeleton. Well, but is, would that be ovaries? I don't know. I don't know. Um, it could. Uh, did we use the same scales? Yeah, I think we did. <laughs> I think we did, Jen. Yeah, yeah. So I, I don't know what the reason is. If it's just because of the skeleton increase, or also maybe because of the tissues that are leaving um, water, it could be also that basically at that time it was inflated and had. More water in, and we wait. I, I I can't remember. Yes, I, I may have got this wrong, so I wasn't quite clear. And you said for some of the hormone sorts of hormones, yeah, you haven't seen those. 
Uh, I haven't had a look at them yet with the expression. But, uh, they're there, though. So yeah, yeah. The, I can find the homologs, um, but I haven't actually looked at them yet. And for me, the hormone receptors would be more interesting to look at with um, antibodies than really in C2 or RNA expression. I mean, that's very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, what David suggested that I basically should take those clusters and um, reverse blast those against um, other, like just use, doing a blast search with those clusters and see what I can come up with if that's the initial hit or if it's just some. Um, you mean across all the animal kingdoms? Yeah, yeah. across all the animal kingdoms. <coughs> <coughs> <laughs> Huh? <laughs> I don't know why they have copy the books, why not? No. Well, I think yeah. I'm, I'm curious if you call them ovaries, because most people wouldn't even call them like they're not organs. Yeah. I mean they're yeah. basically just yeah. eggs and they're yeah. just like sitting yeah. in the messenger eggs. So yeah. Similarly they're not they're not testes, they're just sperm yeah. eggs. They're yeah. just sperm clusters. Yeah. So they're not like they have organs as such. Yeah. Mm. Interesting. Because yet maybe they're I mean your best last hit with this yeah. particular coral gene, but if you turn it around, yeah. is, is <coughs> that, that coral gene, that particular coral gene is the best hit with that mm. protein? Um, you know, I suspect that in many cases these, these proteins are kind of related but doing different things. Most of them are released by the pituitary, aren't they? So no, the pituitary stimulates the pituitary system. In a human, sorry, I'm thinking in humans. <laughs> Just as an aside, <laughs> clarify that. I have another question yeah. about the the um, fungus. Um, so the five individuals you've got, they were all collected the same year, time, the yeah. tissues. Yeah. So. You're kind of assuming that differences in gene expression is primarily driven by the sex differences yeah. rather than environmental differences. Yeah. And that could, lots of things that could yeah. influence. Because yeah. so I was thinking it would be nice to have to do a male, the same individual, and the male one year and then the female another year, but then you've got the different environmental conditions, unless you had them in the aquarium or something like that. Mm. <laughs> well, you know. yeah. 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 Are these are they tags? Yes. Yeah. They're all tags. They're all tags. Yeah. Yeah. And I actually want to go back very soon to mm -hmm. collect the rest of them. Which is now in the same time frame after spawning like the first one that I collected. So. Yeah. Ah, oh, okay. Oh, sorry. I, sorry. I only want people who can see. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, Nella. Hi. Great. Time. Thank you very much. It's okay. really fascinating story about fungi, how they do that. I'm just yeah, uh, a bit behind. How, how is that happening? Can you see how they change from female, how fungi change from female to male and opposite? Is there any phenotypic changes you could see, or can you so predict somehow, somewhere? I don't know. No, the only prediction that I have is that the very small ones are most likely the males, and the very big ones are most likely the females. But that's my only prediction. There's no phenotypic difference between the male and the female mm -hmm. whatsoever. That's why I'm saying I, I really would like to know what genes. If there are sex specific genes, you yeah, can use them to identify basically within this medium range of where they change the sex, who's a male and who's a female prior to spawning, and then maybe use this step then to manipulate, for example, environment conditions to see what possibly might trigger the sex change. And even what I really would like to do is follow the sex change over several months, like take tissue samples over several months and see how the genes. Um, genes Change over this time frame. But, yeah, yeah. That'd be great. Mm. Thank you. Another three-year project. <laughs> <laughs>
Do you think sex change is a program or is more like a trade off between two and What do you believe? Um, I think there is, at one stage, there might be some program behind it because you can find hardly any really big males. Um, or, like, all the really huge population seems to be female, at least for the brown fungus. Um, but I think there is also some environmental effects. Um, triggering it as well as nutritional or um, energy uh, maintaining effect. So if the coral has a lot of energy, it's probably smart to be a female maybe because you actually really have, if you get fertilized, your output is uh, much better than if you are a, a, a male because so many males like, can basically release so many more uh, sperm but their chance of um, finding that one egg is, is lower. So, do you understand what I'm saying? Kind of. Yeah. I think you mentioned is that other DNA domains put in uh, exclusively involved in sex determination or kind of other They are. In other organisms? In other organisms, they are also involved in. Um, uh, neurogenesis, myo myogenesis, and some other which I can't remember. So basically, for completely different reasons. So that can explain the, the variation in your yeah. Yeah. expression patterns. Yeah. Yeah. Which makes other things too. Good. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs>